Uh, well, welcome everybody in person and watching on TV uh, to the uh, August 11th, 2022 Town of Webster Board's workshop. Um, we actually have four agenda items tonight. Three of them are presentations, uh, but we're going to start out with uh, a resolution um, consideration to approve a <laughs> fill permit at 1355 Lake Road. So I'm going to hand it off to the town engineer, uh, Mary Harrington, on this one. Um, hello. So, um John Kashani is in. He owns the property at 1355 Lake Road. It is currently undeveloped with a proposal into um, the town departments to review it administratively for a four lot uh, single family resident subdivision. Um, to achieve the grading for that subdivision, the owner wishes to truck in approximately 1,000 cubic yards of fill. We've reviewed this and um, applied certain conditions to the approval. Um, so as long as Mr. Kashani is uh, understanding of the conditions, then I would, uh, <coughs> I would suggest that the town board approve the fill permit. Okay. And John, I, do you want to say anything? I mean, I know you, you don't want me to say anything. Oh. No, Mary said it very well. We're, okay. We're just looking to bring in some stuff. Actually, no, I would. John, I, you know, last so house shouldn't throw stones, but I don't think you've ever met a microphone you haven't talked at, so. Okay. I'm John Kashani. I live at 893 DeWitt Road in Webster. And as Mary said, we're requesting a fill permit, and I understand fill permits require approvals from the town board. So Mary has addressed or uh, directed me to the board. I would like to say that on this 10 acre parcel, <clears throat> we're looking at four lots. One is actually five acres. The other are all in abundance of beyond one acre, acre and a half, that sort of thing. Um, so we're not making anything high density over here. Um, sadly, all the fill material that I'm asking to bring in used to sit on this property and it was taken off a few years ago and um, nothing to do with any town staff that's here whatsoever, but um, there was probably 15,000 cubic yards removed from, from this site. And um, I was just told today, it, it, just, it just went to another site in Webster. I'm sure there were probably no approvals, no permits, they, it, it just disappeared. So I'm re asking to replace a small amount of it. The reason for replacing the small amount is um, not dictated by anything having to do with the elevation of the homes. Um, the sewers are gonna be required to have a sewer pump. Um, so uh, we do not get the luxury of having gravity um, off of these four lots. Um, but to create positive drainage away from the private drive and away from the front yard <coughs> lots, um, it would be nice, but not required to have the fill, um, I think the highway department won't get calls saying there's puddles in, in people's drive or in their yard or on the drive or anything. So I think this is simply the right thing to do and I'd appreciate the board's consideration and thank you for your time. Thanks, Ed. Thanks. Thank you. Um, does the board have any questions before we? No. Nope. Motion on this, Bill? No. No, Patty? No. no. Okay. Well. Then I make a motion to approve a fill permit at 1355 Lake Road. Second. Supervisor Flaherty? Aye. Councilwoman Wynn? Aye. Councilman Cahill? Aye. Councilwoman Cataldi? Aye. Councilman Abbott? Aye. All righty. With a minute to spare. Well, our first presentation tonight, and I got to tell you something, I've been excited about this one. Um, this summer, uh, I would say, I think that the, the, the engineering department and also the Department of Community Development had three college interns uh, working for the town, uh, Caleb Lendeck, Paul Staub, and Jacob Cooney. And tonight, they're gonna do a presentation for the board and for the community of their experiences assisting the engineering and community development departments this summer. So, guys, 
Have at it. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for being here today. My name is Caleb. I'm one of the interns of the Town of Webster Engineering and Community Development Departments. Beside me are my fellow interns, Paul and Jacob. We will be doing a short presentation tonight on the internship program, some of what we've done, our work environment, some of the training we've received, uh, some of the jobs that we've completed, some of the projects we've been able to sit in on, uh, and its impacts on us going forward. So a little about us, as I mentioned, my name's Caleb. I'm actually the only one here that's not from Webster. I'm from Hilton. Uh, I'm currently attending MCC, planning on transferring to ESF in Syracuse for a bachelor's degree in natural resource management. Uh, after that, planning on pursuing a master's degree in urban planning, possibly at the University of Albany. Uh, I'm interested in working in an urban planning related field uh, or something related to that. And I'm particularly interested in working for a government agency of some sort. Hi, my name is Paul. Um, I was born and raised here in Webster, and I'm currently going into my senior year at the University of Buffalo for environmental engineering. And prior to this internship, I really had no experience in engineering, so I wasn't sure what kind of job I would like in the end. But from the experiences and people I've met here, I've now decided I'd like to join some kind of consulting firm or possibly work for a governmental agency like the DEC in my future. Hi, my name is Jacob Cooney. Um, I was also born and raised in Webster. Um, the past four years, I was at Ithaca College studying physics, and now I'm transferring to ESF as well um, to pursue environmental engineering, and that's what I hope to do in my future. So um, we all kind of decided why, or kind of had the same reasons why we're interested in uh, this internship position. Um, firstly, we wanted to gain some real-life experience um, in the fields of engineering and also planning um, and kind of get a feel for what it's like. Um, also, we wanted to make you know, meaningful connections with professionals in uh, both fields um, and then hopefully make some really, really important connections to propel us in our careers in the future. So some training that we've received um, through this internship include secret training. Um, so we were able to sit in with Mary um, on one of her continuing education courses about Seeker and learn about that whole process, um, especially about some land use laws and also zoning ordinances that go along with that. Um, we also all completed a four hour erosion and sediment control training course. So we could all do slip inspections, and that lasts for three years. Um, so we can continue to do those in the future if we need to. We also learned how to fill out and review the environmental assessment forms. Um, those go along with the seeker process, but also we reviewed them for Josh, um, for all the planning board and, well, not all of them, but for some of the planning board and zoning board applications that were sent in. Um, we were also trained in to do multiple site ins uh, inspections and assessments um, and how to use the GPS unit here. And then also the multiple different softwares we used, including ArcGIS, um, Bluebeam to annotate site plans, and also Laserfish to uh, do research on all the planning board and zoning board minutes. We worked on a multitude of different projects over the summer. Um, most of them were kind of in a group, all of us together, but we also had kind of our own independent projects that we were able to work on. We scanned in and uploaded over 700 maps, um, plans, and surveys to the town files. Um, that was Caleb's work mostly. He spearheaded that um, and has made some pretty impressive progress. We um, helped out Josh with a hypothetical population growth um, estimate for the town of Webster. So we took all the vacant land in Webster and if that were all developed, um, what the maximum population in Webster would be under the current zoning. And we found an estimate of around 59,000 uh, people for the population. 
We also completed 125 pond and outfall inspections and compiled those all into one spreadsheet so that the town and the highway department know when each pond needs to be inspected next and then what sort of maintenance needs to be done. We also sent out pond letters or letters to residents that live next to stormwater management ponds um, just to inform them on some better maintenance practices. <coughs> And then just to continue on with that, some more of the projects and assignments that we were able to complete. So over our course, we were able to complete over 50 SWIP inspections of active construction sites around town. We were also able to complete 129 site inspections of the West Webster Hamlet um, properties. And we were able to write up an executive summary on this area, talking about the condition of the exterior of each of the properties, as well as some recommendations for the area. Um, we were able to remove illegal signage from the town of Webster that was in the right-of-ways by driving around town and hopping out of the trucks and grabbing them. <laughs> and then <laughs> we, were able, we were able to help gather data from other municipalities to help Webster update its own codes and put them all in one place for Josh to help him out. And then finally, we were able to update the construction project tracking checklist, which is a document on SharePoint. We basically just put all the relevant files onto SharePoint from our own network just in case the town ever decides to move into using more of SharePoint. And then for our work environment, um, the day-to-day -day was kind of something new each day, and there was always something for us to do and keep ourselves busy with. So it was of oftentimes a pretty even split between office work and field work. And our office work entailed computer work, which was just writing up reports or organizing data. Uh, meetings, we would attend PRC meetings, uh, developer meetings, as well as um, some construction meetings and department meetings. And then we would also organize and scan documents. We scanned maps, surveys, plans, and we were also tried to organize the library room, which was quite a challenge with all the things in there. <laughs> and then finally, we spent some time in the archives just looking for important documents, trying to find some. And as for field work, we did all sorts of types of inspections, from SWIP inspections to site inspections, as well as many pond, wet pond and dry pond inspections. Uh, with tours, we got to tour both the county and the town's wastewater treatment facilities. And we would be just basically information gatherers for Josh and Mary. Any site that they needed information on, we would head out to take pictures and report back on. So in terms of our expectations versus reality, we definitely expected working with a smaller group of people, uh, almost exclusively in Town Hall, but that wasn't the case at all. While we did work with many employees from Town Hall, we also worked with other departments, such as Highway and Sanitary, and a little bit of Parks and Rec. We also got to work with many different contractors and developers and other outside firms, uh, especially at the Sandbar Park Project, being able to sit in on the developer meetings and communicate with campus management and Keeler and Passero. It was a really great experience to be able to uh, make those connections and get all the business cards from those other firms. We expected a more structured environment where we had more of a schedule and were under the direct daily supervision of Josh and Mary, but that wasn't the case at all. So long as we were completing our project, you know, getting the deadlines completed on time and ensuring a high quality of work for every assignment, uh, we were basically able to manage ourselves, and it was very refreshing to be able to use our own time management abilities to complete projects. We also expected to do a large amount of work in GIS, uh, specifically taking out the GPS unit and taking measurements and then plugging that directly into the ArcGIS database. But we ended up using ArcGIS more as, as a tool to help track down other projects that we were working on. So some of the most interesting projects or experiences that we've had this summer include the Sandbar Park Project. It was a lot of fun being able to sit in on those developer meetings, uh, being able to do the SWIP inspections for the park was very interesting. Uh, dealing with the developers and the contractors that were down there was always uh, a different experience every time. <laughs> Uh, going on the Webster and County Sanitary Plant tours were also very interesting. Sanitary gets a bad rap. Uh, being able to see the raw sewage essentially go to what looks like 
safe, clean drinking water. It's an incredible process. So we really did enjoy the plant tours. The West Webster Hamlet site analysis project was also very interesting. We walked up and down Ridge Road, Gravel, Empire Boulevard, and did the surveys of the out exterior conditions, putting that all together in a couple of different maps to show an overview of the different uh, house, you know, the houses in that area, and then putting together an executive summary for Josh was also uh, a very unique experience that helped to combine a couple of our different interests. And then the hypothetical growth mapping project was also very interesting. Uh, putting together the methodology to come up with the calculations necessary to figure out how many uh, houses could be built in the current zoning and using Bureau of Labor Statistics to come up with a population estimate based on that. Working with Josh and Chris on all of that, it was a very unique experience. And having that data get used for real world application, such as the uh, extension of the highway department, the garage project that they have right now, it was very fulfilling and rewarding to be able to get to do that with them. So some of what we learned from this experience and its impact on us going forward, a lot of technical terminology. There were times, especially in the sandbar meeting, where terms and specifications and details would be thrown around and we would have no idea what any of it meant. We'd write it all down and come back and then ask questions and do some research on it. So we had really gained a lot from that in terms of practical uh, information on actual building materials and specifications. Site inspection process and building review process, as we already kind of mentioned, we did a lot with SWIP, Seeker, MS4, EAFs, uh, seeing all the flow charts, the type one and type two actions, going through the building review process and the site inspection process, seeing some of the things that we've heard about but never really did any research on or had experience with was a very useful experience to have. And this really did reaffirm our interest in municipal policy and planning and engineering. Before this, we kind of pictured upon graduation going into a private firm of some sort, but we have definitely reconsidered and broadened our interests to include government, uh, whether that be at city or municipal, state or even federal level. So it's definitely shifted our focus a little bit. And in terms of our degree programs, it's been very useful to see what our day-to-day -day work environment may be like upon graduation. So in that regard, it's also been a very useful experience. So on to the questions and answers. But before we get to the questions, we'd also like to th say thank you to Josh and Mary for their leadership. It's been really great working under both of you. Uh, we've learned a ton. And we'd also like to say thank you to everyone at the departments of Public Works. Uh, everybody's been very kind and very helpful and very knowledgeable. So just want to say thank you to everybody. All right, on to the questions. I have one question. Yeah. Can you stay? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you guys I know. have done an incredible amount of work, and it's it's just wonderful to hear about your experience. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Thank Great you, everybody. Work. Great work. Thank it's you. very nice yeah. to know all of you guys. Is, uh, very impressed. As Patty said, you guys have done a great deal of work. And I know you've been an asset to, to both Mary and Josh, and just look at the breadth of, of work that you've done. It has really helped out their department a great deal, and, and also the highway. So I'm glad you had a good time, and you had a a very good um, working experience, especially with developers at the Sandbar Park. And I can uh, and empathize with uh, being in meetings with developers and not really understanding some of the terminology that they use. And you know, you don't want to ask the question right then because then you, you know you feel like, well, I'm a little embarrassed. But it, it, it's a testament that you go back and you you know you do your research and, and it helps you in the next meeting. So then you know you you garner more and more uh, more experience and knowledge and um, you know, I, I can't thank you enough for all the work that you guys have done. Well, thank you. We appreciate it. It's definitely been a mutual experience. So I think uh, so long as they got a lot out of us as, too, as well, we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank Congratulations. You. Thank you. And, can I, and Bill, do you have anything? Or? Um, I don't have any comments. They did an awful lot of work, and we yeah. appreciate it. And, and I will just say two things. Number one, uh, as I've gotten to know Mary, she's a tough boss. And you made it, I think, easier for her to be the boss because you guys exceeded expectations. I mean, I, when you talked about 
you thought it'd be more structured, but you were given freedom to work in your time uh, things toward finishing things. That's a testament to you guys. I, I, I really do believe that Mary and Josh were able to do that because they saw that you guys were self-starters and you were conscientious. The second thing is, and I've said this, <laughs> I want to thank you guys for hitting the ground with this internship program and being really great at it this year because this is something I'd like to expand at the town. Or I think we need to look at it for like the, the sewer department, the water resource recovery, uh, maybe in the clerk's office. You know, I, I, There's budgetary aspects to it, but boy, I think we learned this summer that we get such a bang for the buck out of these uh, college kids that are talented. And uh, it's a win for the town, and I, I hope it was a win for you. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck at school this year. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, we are right on time, huh? Um, the next up is a presentation by... Well, I'm not sure exactly if it's going to be Josh and or Mary and or Councilman Kale, but a little update presentation on the building that we're sitting in right now. Uh, so I'll hand the baton to you three to figure out who starts. Sure. Josh, you can drive the bus to start. Okay, I'll start this one out. So this presentation is basically to bring you up to speed on where we're at with the courthouse roof and interior repairs. Um, so we're going to briefly cover the following topics. Um, we're going to kind of explain in detail the roof deficiencies, um, some potential corrective measures, uh, some of the remediation needs for the building. Um, interior refinishing, uh, rough estimate for a schedule, as well as um, some cost ranges for the um, cost of the work. So in terms of the existing uh, roof deficiencies, uh, there's kind of two components to it. Uh, the first being interior. Um, when this building was built back in the 70s, um, there was a lack of insulation, particularly on the peaked metal roof portion um, with the cathedral ceilings where the lobby and court rooms are. Um, so the result of that is, you know, heat loss, uh, obviously from our heating equipment. Um, and there's also HVAC equipment above the ceiling that that also um, kicks off heat. So the result of that is the heat is rising. It's hitting a cold metal roof. And then any snow deposits uh, during the winter then start melting. Um, then the temperature drops below freezing and starts to form icicles, which causes an ice damming situation. Um, so the exterior portion of the roof issue is the lack of a proper overhang uh, and drip edge. Um, so basically the angled metal roof um, just meets a vertical wall and there tends to be ice buildup in that location as a result of the freeze and thaw cycles that we often get in the winter months. So when that <coughs> ice builds up, um, it, it tends to find the seams and the fastener holes and ultimately starts leaking water into the building. Um, so what you're looking at here on the screen is, are some photos of what I just described. Uh, this photo was taken in February of this year. Uh, as you can see, a lot of the snow had melted um, or slid off the roof, melted and refroze, um, creating this icicle uh, wall. And then on the second photo to the right, you can see the lack of a drip edge. Uh, it's just essentially the um, metal roof um, meeting the vertical portion of the building, um, and it results in the ice formation and buildup. So a result of that, um, this was, these are photos that were taken 
after the incident that occurred in February. Um, you could see there were several areas of the building where there was water leaking in from the ceilings. Um, there were uh, paint bubbling, you know, down the wall where moisture was getting in, as well as, you know, pretty extensive water damages on the ceiling. So in terms of corrective measures, um, we've looked at a variety of different options. Um, I think that we're in agreement that it's a two-pronged uh, effort to correct this issue once and for all. Uh, the first aspect deals with um, interior. So actually adding spray foam insulation <coughs> on the inside of the sloped roof uh, where it doesn't currently exist, and um, applying an intumescent paint. Uh, this is a term I was not familiar with, but um, essentially it's a product that gets applied over the self, uh, the spray foam insulation, and it, it actually expands and increases the overall R value of the insulation. So the thought being, uh, if we can keep the heat from escaping, um, there won't be uh, as many freeze-thaw issues when it comes to the, the change in water temp or air temperatures. Um, so then the exterior portion uh, would be to install a new metal drip edge, approximately three to four inches um, extending from the existing roof edge and some additional waterproofing measures. And we think that between the two of these two modifications, we think will uh, prevent <clears throat> this from occurring in the future. So initial estimates range uh, between 20 and $25,000 for this component of the work. And another Twenty to 25000 for the exterior components. Now, when it comes to remediation needs, um, we did have uh, air testing performed and material sampling um, in a couple different locations throughout the building. Uh, they did come back with um, confirmation of elevated levels of mold in certain areas. Uh, primarily within the surplus room um, and the lobby of the courthouse. So we will obviously need to address that issue as a part of this project. Um, that would include removal of visibly damaged uh, drywall, ceiling tiles, and any fiberglass insulation. And then those areas would be treated um, with an EPA-approved disinfectant and or biocide. So we actually did um, get three quotes for this work. Um, we're estimating that uh, it would cost right around 15000 for the mold remediation aspect. Um, obviously, that's subject to change because if they start um, you know, opening up walls and, and find that it's in worse condition than we thought, uh, the scope of that effort may increase. Um, so then the other part of the project would be obviously um, refinishing all of the disrupted areas, um, you know, replacing all of the drywall that's removed, um, resheet rocking the ceiling where the sp in the areas where the spray foam is applied, um, you know, re-drywalling the walls and ceilings impacted by the, re the mold remediation effort. Um, possible carpet replacements, and then um, there's also some pathways and lights and metal appurtenances above the drop ceiling that are affected by the rust uh, due to condensation that's occurring in the ceiling. So uh, we, we estimate that the cost of repairing this portion uh, would be right around $30,000 and that would also be 
subject to change depending on the extent of the damage that is found uh, when we start opening things up. <clears throat> so we've put together a rough um, time frame <coughs> schedule to try and address this issue before the upcoming winter season. Um, so the first portion would be interior and exterior correctives. Uh, we would look to have that complete um, by the end of November, hopefully before the first snowfall. Um, it would require solicitation of uh, three quotes and some coordination in terms of scheduling uh, with potential contractors. And then we would move on to the remediation phase, um, which would be dealing with the, the mold. Um, we've, I've, as I mentioned, we've already obtained three quotes for this professional service. Uh, we would look to have that done um, by the end of this year in December. And then um, we're proposing that the refinishing and the, the putting back together, if you will, um, would take place um, in late winter, early spring of next year. Um, this would give us an opportunity to make sure that the spray foam and the um, roof soffit extension truly addresses the ice damming issue. We certainly wouldn't want to go ahead and re-drywall everything um, and then have this similar situation occur again. Um, but depending on the scope of the, you know, that process, which will be dictated by the first two, uh, that may require a public bid. Um, so kind of just to sum it all up uh, and recap, we think that the spray foam insulation would cost between 20 and 25,000. Uh, the, the roof drip edge modification, potentially another 20 to 25,000. Um, the remediation, which we have a pretty good handle on, um, would be about 15,000. And then interior refinishing and the drywall work would be an additional 30,000. So our initial estimate at this point in time is between 85 and $95,000. And obviously that is dependent on the extent of the damage. <coughs> so uh, obviously with this, the nature of this work, uh, there, there are some possible disruptions that could occur. Um, we're obviously gonna try and work with the selected contractors to minimize the amount of disruption to both the court schedule as well as um, meetings that take place in this room, town board meetings and workshops, um, planning board and zoning board meetings. Um, if necessary, um, we may need to make temporary accommodations, um, particularly for the court and its staff, and we may need to um, explore <coughs> Alternative, lo me, alternative locations for um, holding town meetings. Um, so we've begun to communicate uh, this plan uh, with any departments that may potentially be affected. And um, like I said, we're gonna try and minimize the disruption to the greatest extent possible. Um, so with that, uh, we can turn it over for discussion and hopefully answer any questions that anyone might have. <coughs> Under number five, you have a drawing there. It's uh, the wall detail, and that came from where? Um, I believe, are you speaking of right. this? Yes. <coughs> that was uh, from the bid documents from when the renovations occurred at this building. Right. Um, that's, not, that's not what we have right now, correct? But what's being proposed is very similar to this in that they're adding blocking and they're adding an extension so that that drip edge um, will be out there, right? That is correct. So I just wanted to point that out in case, you know, people were wondering what that drawing was there for. Yes, that's to represent um, the extended um, drip right. edge and soffit right. to kind of push the snow and ice 
further away from the building. Right. And the, in the, in the pictures that you show with the snow and the ice going up that knee wall, that was after the snow had been shoveled away from the knee wall, or? This picture here? Yeah. With, did the Parks and Rec shovel that, some of that snow away from that knee wall, or no? Yes. Um, we did have a pretty substantial snowfall um, with then warming temperatures. So yes, uh, upon the leaking that occurred, we did get up on the roof and we shoveled a path so that we could access the whole length right. um, for further inspection. I know that um, the HVAC lines that run through above the ceiling grid, they, they are wrapped in insulation, but it's, it's about an eighth of an inch. I, I was looking at a, a job down that we're working on down in the, the corner of Joseph and Clinton, and they had some of the ceiling tiles up. I was talking to the GC down there about what he felt was, um, you know, proper thickness, and we're not even close. So that's something that we should probably um, take a look at also to increasing the thickness of that um, the insulation that's around the HVAC lines also, just as added protection um, to reduce the uh, or eliminate the condensation, and the heat loss. I just saw that today, so that's why okay. I'm bringing it to your attention today. That makes sense. Because it was, um, there was a significant <coughs> infiltration of water um, <coughs> at this uh, ice damming situation. And I think everybody can see from, from the pictures that, you know, a lot of the contributing factors, A, there's not enough insulation up there, but B, the construction of, that, of the roof line, um, not, not, not having a drip edge, not having, you know, a carrying over, I, really, I think, led to some of the problems, so. Be looking. I know Karen will be looking very forward to uh, getting this, uh, this this stuff fixed. So thanks up for all the work that you and Mary did with the presentation. Sure. And, and Josh, the only I mean, <clears throat> that picture that you have up right there, the pitched metal roof um, that then comes to a vertical where all those icicles are, and then hits the flat roof. That runs north and south, that picture. Right. Yes. And all the leaking really was from that north-south line right yeah. along there. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. It tended to drop in right along the edge, and it traveled along the beam underneath from sure. the front to back. Yeah. Okay. Bill? Got to get fixed. Where are we going to get the money? I love the way he gets right to the point. So do I. Because you're right on both. <clears throat> well, we, it, it, does anybody on the board have a problem with the time frame that this has got to be, the interior and the exterior has to be fixed before the snow flies, and hopefully yeah. it's, it, by, if we do it by November, like Josh just showed, hopefully we won't have the snow flying or at least that type of weather situation. I think we all agree with that. Now... Paul, uh, there he is. Hey! <laughs> Options for how to pay for this. Yeah, well, we have to come from general fund. So we could either um, take a look, see if we have enough available in some of the other budget lines to make some transfers, or we could amend the budget, basically expand the budget, either with appropriated fund balance or if revenues are higher than projected, we could expand the revenue and expense. Or it could possibly use uh, ARPA funds uh, to complete the project, which are currently sitting in the General Park Town Fund, but they'd be transferred over to uh, General Fund or to the Capital Projects Fund to complete the work. Yeah. But I, so I don't think funding is a problem. It's not your, a huge number. I'm sorry. And to your question, Bill, we did look and did submit this um, to the insurance companies, and they said no. We do not have coverage. Well, I know we're on our own, that's for yeah. sure. So <clears throat> I just wondered where Paul would suggest we would take the money from. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Judge Tom, you're here tonight. Uh, so you are representing, I think, who works in this building. 
so we just want to make sure that we're right in lockstep with you and Judge Dave and the clerks. And as we find out stuff, you'll find out stuff. Because as you can see from this, once we launch the open walls up, we don't know. We may have to work around it. Yeah. We may have to work while they're doing construction. Maybe they can stop work for a couple hours while they have work and resume once we're done. I don't know. In certain circumstances. We'll be mindful of it. You know, I know that Councilman Cahill, Josh, you guys, and Mary have talked about, you know, if there's ways the contractor might be able to do it on off hours, if there's a way to get up in the ceiling and not, there's a lot of different things possibly that can be done. There's no doubt you get uh, leakage into the, into the courtroom, you have to move bookcases and things like that. So yeah. It, it's definitely a problem. The rug is stayed, the water's coming down the wall. And yeah. It's definitely a problem. Not to, in the courtroom itself, really, it had, it really haven't had any problem in the office area that I'm aware of. I mean, based on what Josh is saying, that there's some like mold issues uh, in the court clerk's area or, or the chambers or in the courtroom. A, mm -hmm. I, I don't know about the courtroom, but certainly in the, in the clerk in the chambers area, it doesn't appear to be, doesn't appear to be any, any issues but that I'm aware of. That is correct. Um, there, there was no leaking occurring on that side of the building, and I believe the air testing didn't reveal any elevated mold levels in that area. We have air, yeah, mold areas in that reception area, right? Um, the primary area of concern was the surplus room where the furniture is, and that wall that separates right. it from the courtroom. Right, that's the wall that seems to have most of the, the leakage. Right. right. <clears throat> so our strategy would be to attack it from this side, the surplus room side, and hope to not disrupt the courtroom wall. Um, but once, you know, we don't know until they start getting in there. But you always talk to the person about when we're in session. Oh, yeah. I'm sure we can work around that. Okay. Yeah, we'll do our best to work with contractors that um, are flexible. There's a lot of contractors out there that will work off hours and weekends also. Tom, what did you do during the time that the, the town hall shifted over here? Did that affect your the, the way the court was run or how no, it was run? No, it really had no effect at all. Well, I know that uh, some of this we got to, you know, we'll, we'll be town board actions of advertising bids if it's municipal bids and I know Paul you're looking at the 35,000 and under and all the devil in the details of that but we're going to start to launch on that we'll keep everybody apprised if you know we're not looking to bypass having to do municipal bids per se but from a timeliness standpoint if it is $25,000 uh, you know maybe we can just do uh, almost like you do uh, professional services, a couple of estimates, you know, whatever. Yeah, there's various components to this. Uh, <clears throat> if it's under 35,000, if we can do a, uh, create our RFP and uh, get quotes based on that written RFP. Yeah. If it's 35,000 or more for each certain components, you have to bid it. Right. So just so everybody understands, I mean, today's August 11th, three months from today is November 11th, so you know, we will start after this with the launch, per se, of quotes uh, on the exterior, the interior, whether they got to be municipal bid. Everybody will be keep apprised of that. The only other thing I have, because if I'm sitting at home or I'm in the audience here watching this or watching a tape, you know, when you hear that, well, we had elevated mold levels, and we're talking about, you know, not taking care of that for potentially a couple of months. Josh, I know you're not a mold expert or very or this and that, but the, the company that did it, and I don't want to put words in their mouth, but it, it wasn't a situation where like, you got to shut this place down or whatever. There's mold everywhere. <clears throat> Correct. There, there's natural levels of mold right. everywhere in the, in the air. Um, 
it just so happens that certain areas of the building were a little elevated. Right. And I know that's a subjective term, but there is some <coughs> tangible metrics and whatever that the uh, the company that did the testing, you know, gave us a. We're going to get it taken care of, but it wasn't something where you really need to shut down this facility and do it immediately. It wasn't correct. Elevated levels to that point. Is that a safe statement? Yes. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Or? No. No. All right. Josh, Mary, Councilman Kale. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Right. Thanks for your work. Bob, I tried to give you an extra <coughs> five minutes so you could nap. Our last item of the, the evening is um, Bob Wimmer from Navitas, who is the um, energy performance contracting consulting firm that the town has retained for, uh, God help me Rick on this one, the wastewater recovery resource. Um, who's gonna give us an update of where the project is at. And uh, Bob has the nice green golf shirt on, and Bob has had some planes, trains, and automobile fun coming up from suburban Baltimore. Correct. We're supposed to fly up today for this, as many people know with traveling. His flight got canceled, so Bob had to jump in the car and drive up here. So thanks for doing that. It's a nice drive. It is. It's good weather, finally. It's time to drive, yes. And it's a good thing you didn't have to start on the West Coast. Exactly, <laughs> right. So, uh, while Art's pulling up the presentation, uh, I'm Bob Wimmer with Navitas Project Manager uh, for, for this project. Uh, and one of the things I do want to start off with is uh, my thanks to uh, Art, Rick, uh, and his full team. Uh, this project uh, is very interactive, uh, and they've been very timely, uh, very helpful with getting information, making decisions, uh, and uh, putting in the effort that is needed to keep this project moving as we uh, enter our sixth month. Uh, so, here we go. Uh, so just a, uh, a refresher on uh, where we are in the project. Um, the uh, top line uh, is what's known as a traditional uh, project delivery. This is the uh, design bid build methodology. Uh, so right now in that uh, box on the, the far left where it says basis of design, uh, that is where the project would be. And you can see it moves in a very linear stand, uh, linear approach. Uh, this delivery method, the Article 9 Collaborative Design Build Methodology, uh, we're currently in, in that large box, uh, which includes a number of things, including the development of the basis of design uh, and the design documents uh, for construction. Uh, also, uh, we are doing an ongoing financial evaluation of the project, uh, and we've got our uh, construction trade partners uh, all on board. Uh, so we are doing a lot of activity at the same time, which gives us a lot of benefits, and I think gives the town a lot of benefit of uh, better information to make decisions. So just a quick refresher for everyone of the, uh, the wastewater plant, uh, for those who are not familiar. Uh, there's two uh, components to the project here. Uh, one is known as the asset renewal. Uh, we refer to this as the cost of doing business. Uh, the second is the WRRF, or Water Resources Recovery Facility <coughs> components of the project. Uh, and this is uh, the elements of the project that provide a revenue enhancement opportunity for the town uh, to offset some of the operating costs. So throughout the project, we have a number of components uh, that are asset renewal, uh, and then uh, two major components that are the WRRF, the solids handling facility, and the new biosolids and outside waste acceptance facility. Uh, so over the last five months, we've had a lot of project activity. Uh, we have uh, just completed and submitted uh, the basis of design report uh, to DEC. Uh, this includes uh, significant documentation on the, the design, uh, all the calculations necessary, along with our 30% drawing set uh, as we delve into the details of what it will really take uh, to construct and operate this facility. Also, very importantly, uh, we have been uh, working with uh, the local community, uh, both uh, waste producers, waste haulers, 
uh, and those who uh, may be interested in uh, the future fertilizer product. And uh, in a series of uh, interviews uh, and surveys with these individuals, we have identified a significant amount of uh, potential waste uh, that could turn into revenue uh, for the town, and also a number of markets for the fertilizer product, which will take a cost uh, and lower that significantly by making a marketable product. Uh, over the course of uh, the last couple of months, we have done a number of grant applications. Uh, right now, uh, $18 million uh, of grant applications have already been filed. Um, and we have a number one, uh, number, another one of the WIA grant uh, that will be due uh, on September 9th. Uh, so that uh, all told, we're doing whatever we can in order to offset uh, the cost that uh, the town uh, would have to, or the citizens would have to pay uh, by trying to get as many grants uh, as possible. As part of these grant applications, we have also been reaching out to uh, those same firms uh, that uh, were interested in utilizing the facility for either waste disposal or taking the fertilizer. Uh, they have offered letters of support. We've also been able to get some letters of support for some local industries who see this as an asset uh, to them to be able to continue to expand their businesses and also uh, from uh, other uh, entities that are interested in de doing development in the town uh, and see uh, the expansion as an asset uh, for the ability to treat their waste. So quick update on uh, where we are on looking at the projected revenue. Uh, so the four main sources of potential revenue are septage and leachate, uh, two liquid waste coming into the facility. High strength organic waste, this is food production waste, uh, other food type products, easily digestible materials. And finally, municipal wastewater sludges. These are the uh, sludges made by other uh, municipalities at their wastewater plants uh, where they would need to dispose of them rather than taking them to the landfill uh, as Webster currently does. Uh, so in uh, the original 2021 PER projection, there was about $560,000 per year uh, in potential revenue. Uh, we are now putting a projection in at about $1.15 uh, million, uh, so more than double uh, the revenue projection. Uh, we also see that there is uh, excess material in the market. Uh, this is a... Uh, a projection, we don't want to make this rosy and uh, say that everything is going to happen. So we have uh, dialed it back. Uh, we feel very comfortable that this is a good revenue projection uh, and, uh, and has shown a, uh, a v there's a lot of interest in the, uh, in the market uh, for this facility to be put online. So next on to the budget update. With uh, the current situation, uh, the budget has expanded. Uh, from July of 2021 at the $31 million. Uh, we are now working with a budget right now of $44.2 million. If we move to the next one, talk about some of the issues there. Um, so as we look at the impacts on the budget, um, the investment in revenue opportunities, as I said, more than double the potential revenue uh, means that we had to design facilities that would be capable of taking in all this additional waste. So we have greatly expanded the acceptance capacity uh, for the different types of waste, um, along with looking very hard at uh, the truck traffic flow and the operator safety within the facility so that as the, uh, the uh, facility becomes uh, a revenue source, there's gonna be more traffic. And we wanted to make sure that uh, there was easy flow both from uh, a business side, uh, but also from the staff side to make sure that they are operating in a safe environment. Um, I don't think anyone has escaped the inflation that exists today, and certainly the construction industry has not. Uh, so we have seen significant price increases in equipment, uh, in building materials. Uh, so that is uh, just a reality of today's business uh, environment. Uh, we have also, as I stated, gotten deep into the design. And as you get into the design, there's a lot of details that come out, a lot of conflicts that were not realized. And as we have a facility now that we know how we can construct and operate, uh, there were additional costs that were necessary in order to accomplish the goals uh, of the project. So I just wanted to do a quick way of, uh, of summarizing this. Uh, so one of the project goals uh, that uh, we worked with uh, was that uh, we wanted to provide Webster with the highest value 
uh, per annual net cost of the project. So debt service uh, minus the, the revenue and savings that came in. So if we go through uh, where we were in June of 2021, the asset renewal project, the what just has to be done, the cost of doing business was a $19 million project with a, an annual town obligation of about 1.1 million. This was the debt service uh, and the operating costs associated with those, those upgrades. Uh, when combined in uh, June 2021, the asset renewal and WRF project or the revenue enhancement project uh, totaled $31 million uh, that was discussed back in uh, June of 21. And this had an annual obligation of uh, $974,000. So this was where the project paid for itself and helped to offset some of the asset renewal components of the project. Where we are now, while the capital costs uh, for both elements of the project, both the asset renewal and the WRF have increased, um, if only the asset renewal, the cost of doing business uh, components were done, uh, the town obligation would increase to uh, about $1.56 million. Uh, so that's the, the cost of debt service and the operating costs associated with that. However, just as uh, previously, uh, while the total project cost of doing everything together at 44.3, uh, the annual obligation for this is uh, $1,060,000. So as you can see, this uh, annual obligation of doing the full project with the ability to take the revenue, have the additional savings from the biosolids disposal costs, uh, and the other aspects of the project, still has a town obligation that is less than what just the asset renewal project was a year ago uh, before the age of inflation and before a lot of the clarity was there. So it's still a project that meets the goals where we're trying to find the highest value per the net cost to the town. Uh, and we've done that through identifying additional revenue and trying to uh, provide capacity for the system uh, to continue to grow and take more in. In terms of next steps, uh, we're presenting uh, tonight, uh, August 11th, uh, to the workshop to give an update to the town. The next major grant application uh, goes in on September the 9th. Um, we are in a position uh, to uh, negotiate and execute an early equipment uh, purchase and construction contract in October and November uh, with approval of the town. And we would like to have groundbreaking in spring of 23, uh, as soon as the construction season can open. Uh, such that we can start to get these savings and revenues uh, into the town as soon as possible. So with that, I'm very happy to answer any questions that <clears throat> anyone might have. Uh, my question might be for all three of you, but you mentioned uh, the WIA grant application September 9th. I know we applied for this last year and, it, and we were turned down for it. We did not receive the grant. Um, what what do we need to do to beef up that application and make this uh, a fundable project through WIA's eyes? Sure. So some of the things that WIA sees as um, beneficial or more favorable in awarding the grants, one is that the project is construction ready. Uh, you have already checked that box. You have a design. You have your team ready to go. Uh, by the time that the, the grant application is, you can show all the progress uh, as part of it. Do you feel that we're we're more, quote, shovel ready than we were when our first application went into Significantly this? more shovel ready than okay. you were. Um, secondly, um, the letters of support, um, the, uh, the granting agency, EFC, uh, likes to see that the community is involved and behind the project uh, because those are ultimately the ratepayers. So they want to see those letters of support. And the final piece I would recommend is that um, the uh, agency uh, would like to see that the, bond, the, uh, the town is fully committed to the project. And they see that way of commitment as a bond authorization. So if the bond authorization matches the budget for which the WIA grant uh, is submitted, they find that to be a much more uh, supportive uh, document because they know that the town is committed to the project uh, by doing that bond resolution. So we need to do that before September 9th? Yes, the, uh, the resolution would have to be ready to go so it can go into the packet on September 9th. Yeah, it would be in our best interest to uh, amend the bond resolution to equal 100% of the expected cost. Even though we've applied for many millions in grants, which uh, we're hoping to secure, 
Well, doesn't we mean saw, we're going to spend to the gross amount. And we saw that with phase one, we did a bond resolution for the total amount and then received mm -hmm. grant funding and it came in at less. Correct. So the borrowing would be the approved bond resolution less any grants or internal funds that have been committed to the project. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. And correct me if I'm wrong, uh, this time the we grant application, they've taken the cap off before it was 25% of the project. 25% of the project, correct? Up to five million, and now they've taken that off, so it can be anywhere up to what ten million now in, in funding. Right. So, a uh, if a forty-four million dollar project is submitted, you would be eligible for eleven million dollars in grant funding. Uh, what they have done, uh, instead of having a total cap for the project, is they have an annual distribution cap. Uh, so instead of the funds coming in one lump sum, they would be distributed in five million dollars per year for a fiscal year. Uh, so with the construction <coughs> schedule, the, the funds would still be coming in during the, the construction period. Hey Bob, can you go backwards on the screenshots to that one? Yes, sir. I think it's that one. <clears throat> on the far right. Yes. Um, the way that you figured this out, <coughs> you gave no credit for us getting any grants. This was There's no grant money in this. bond for the whole 44 million. That is correct. Which is the quintessential description of being conservative on this. So, okay. Is, and that, did that, I don't want to split air, did that factor in also that the town is committed to two and a half million dollars from our ARPA money for this? No. 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 no okay even making it even more conservative, which is good. Um, and as you said in one of the earlier slides, we've applied, well, as of September 9th, when we apply to WIA, we'll be upwards of $28 million in grant uh, applications. That is correct. I don't, this, you wouldn't be able to answer this, Bob, because I don't think you, well, you weren't around back years ago. Phase one, an asset renewal cost of doing business was $12 million. Basically the secondary clarifiers for the most part. It's a $12 million project. We got a $3 million grant. Is that correct, Art? Correct. Did we get any other grants on phase one? No, we did not. Did we apply for any other grants on phase one? Uh, we did not, and I would question that what other grants were available. Thank you. This project, I know you don't like to hear phase two, or because it's not really phase two. This is a completely different animal that aggregates right now to 44 million with 26 million of it is asset renewal. We got to do it. Just like we had to do the secondary clarifiers. It's rotted out, they're dead. We got to do it. But the revenue production and the cost saving component that is another $18 million, um, those items, and the reason why, Bob, your firm was able to be looked at from Article 9 uh, energy performance contracts, a, a very new concept to the town of Webster. We had never done one before. But it also opens up the grant opportunities that we never had when we did, really, phase one. I, and that I, might be one of the reasons we didn't apply for other grants in phase And one. I would say, you know, completing these grants, uh, the the information and data that Navitus had supplied definitely bolstered uh, those grant applications. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. We may not get any of them. And if we don't, well then Bob just showed the numbers. But if we get them, some of them, we won't get all of them, then these numbers will get better and better and better. Okay. <clears throat> Jenny, anything? Um, thanks for the opportunity to come and visit the plant, and um, I really commend uh, the workers there. You know, with the working conditions, and it's pretty bad. And um, like I said, it uh, again is a multi-million-dollar questions: how we're going to pay for it, and how we're going to improve our town. Mm -hmm. So, but you know, you guys do a wonderful job. Well, thanks for the presentation. I also, I just want to, this is um, 
we had an opportunity individually to to meet with your team and Art and um, go through a much deeper dive into this and um, I had a bunch of questions and uh, all the answers were given and as Tom said this is a project that um, you know we have to complete this given the age and uh, of, the, of the of the sewage treatment plant um, I'm very um, very excited to see the, the the drying facility itself and I think that uh, that'll be the first will be the first of, of, of having this facility in this area and I was very happy um, to learn the amount of research that you've done in speaking with potential vendors down the road. Um, there is one one vendor that uh, would would be capable of sending a tractor trailer load a day to be processed in there. So we're really we're driving the train as far as you know new technology in, in our sewage treatment plant and um, you know I'm really looking forward to that. And the other question I had was Okay, where, where, as far as construction goes, are we going to start? And that's one of the areas that we're going to start first is a drying, the drying facility, while in conjunction, working on other areas of the plant. And my other concern um, was, as I've expressed in, in other meetings on different <coughs> projects, is what about the escalation, okay, of, of costs? Because, you know, we can lock these people into September but obviously the construction is not going to take till you know we're not going to be done in September so I was very happy to learn that um, most of these uh, major components there's at least uh, between four and six different companies that will be submitting prices so that way you can you know work accordingly so um, the work that you've done um, to this date is is pretty significant and it's, it's reflected in the research that you've done so I just want to say thank you very much appreciate it's been my it. pleasure Bill and Patty, I'm very pleased with where we're at. Um, you can't help inflation, it happens, and uh, unfortunately we're trying to build a, something that's not here and inflation's hitting us, but it's got to get done. 28 million, is, there was no doubt that had to be done. So whatever we can do that can offset that with income coming in with the process, I think it's a good thing to do. Um, no, I, I, as the liaison to, to the wastewater treatment plant, I've been closely working with this team and been at the monthly updates um, where the whole team will get together. I was talking with the supervisor today saying that I'm just I'm blown away every time we get together to meet because there's the brain power and the talent on this team that you've brought together to, to uh, go along rather than the linear line your more condensed version where everyone is working on this in parallel and getting things done. And, <clears throat> excuse me. Each monthly update you bring more information to the table and what's encouraging to me is we when we look at these revenue sources, um, it's based on interviews and research and real data, not not a pie in the sky of what might be happening in some other area. Um, you've gotten you've gotten to know what the facts are and what we're looking at. And I just really appreciate everything you've done so far. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Nobody else has anything. I think we have, uh, this is the conclusion of our town board workshop on August 11th. Thank you everybody for coming and watching. Mm -hmm.